Hey guys, so the day one of BlizzCon just ended, so I figured I would go ahead and compile basically everything that we know about Diablo 4 right now. I know tomorrow they're going to have a systems panel, just going over a bunch of stuff there. Uh, and specifically, you know, uh, uh, they mentioned that they were going to go over some endgame stuff like dungeons and whatever, so definitely go ahead and make a follow-up video to this one over the next the course of the next few days just to follow up and, you know, make sure I cover everything that was mentioned just in case I miss anything. Uh, especially also for this video, if I miss anything here, let me know down below uh, if you guys saw anything that I missed. Um, but other than that, I have a lot to discuss here, so let's go ahead and jump in. But before I do, I just want to make clear that uh, this game is like super early in development after after everything that I saw today. Um, because I did end up watching the Q&A. Uh, there was a few streams that I saw where they had like a developer come and sit in and do like a uh, few question and answer sessions with them, with the chat and stuff. So there was a bunch going down today and they made it abundantly clear that the game was like super early in development. So. Keep that in mind as I discuss all of this. Um, nothing is set in stone, so anything is subject to change here. Uh, but yeah, with that said, let's go ahead and just jump in. The first thing is that the game is set in a massive world. In the demo version at BlizzCon, players reported that the available demo maps were bigger than anything we've ever seen in a Diablo game before. In addition, there seems to be some sort of multiplayer system where you can encounter other players while just roaming around, and there's even a day slash night and weather cycle. So this is definitely something that's unique to Diablo 4 in terms of like the entire Diablo franchise because this has never been as dynamic, as open as other Diablo games. I mean, no, no other Diablo game has been this open to this degree before. We've seen this, I mean, obviously in WoW, uh, some other games like Breath of the Wild, I think, is actually kind of comparable to this. Um, but the idea that you can sort of roam around and encounter other players as you're walking around and stuff, that's pretty cool. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about PvP later, but I think that comes into play here um, uh, in a way. And in terms of like the day, night, slash weather cycles and stuff like that, they mentioned that this is purely cosmetic right now, but they are considering ways in which they could somehow implement this alongside different effects of your abilities and stuff. So like, I don't know, if it's like super hot and you're in like a desert, I guess you could do more damage with like uh, like fire attacks or if it's raining and stuff you'll do more damage with uh, lightning attacks, stuff like that. Poop could be pretty cool, uh, pretty cool interactions there. The story is non-linear, meaning that you can choose which parts of the story that you want to tackle next without there being a set order. So that's also pretty cool because I mean, well first of all I don't know how much the story is going to be playing a part in the game. I mean, in, D in terms of D3, like you played the story and then you never touched the story again. You just went straight into rifts and stuff and just, you know, end game content. Um, so we'll see how much the story plays part, but I guess being able to choose what you want to do next uh, is always preferable rather than being locked into doing like step one, step two, step three. You can, instead of going f from A to B to C, you can go from A to D to C to F to B and stuff like that. So could be pretty cool. Uh, you know, gives you different choices, more freedom. Uh, the game takes place 10 years after the events of Diablo 3, so pretty cool. Uh, there will be five classes, which means that there are currently two that we have, are not aware of yet. Uh, because we know right now that there's a Barbarian and a Sorcerer and a Druid. So that leaves two left. I think that, um, well, the Barbarian covers like the melee brute slash tank. Druid sort of covers like the, the ranged like archer type, I guess, sort of. Well, he's, he's a little bit of a wild card. Uh, and then the Sorcerer covers like the, uh, the mage, like the, the long distance like spellcaster type uh, class, so. We sort of have like the main three types, kind of with Druid covered. Uh, so the remaining two, I don't know, it's tough to say. I think personally, I think the remaining two probably will end up being Necromancer and Monk. Uh, Monk has generally been a favorite of the franchise, same with Necromancer. And I feel like they sort of cover different roles than the already existing three classes do. Um, but it's possible we could see Paladin probably make a comeback from D2. And then maybe Amazon from D1, but Amazon is kind of similar to Demon Hunter. I don't I don't know if they would pick Amazon over Demon Hunter if they want to implement like you know a ranged bow class. Uh, but it's I don't know. It's it's hard to say. They also did also they also uh, kind of well they didn't hint at it, but they they mentioned the possibility of maybe something new that we haven't seen before, so like a new type of class. We'll see. Uh, Treasure Goblins will be back. Nothing special there. It's kind of obvious. 
There are plans for expansions later on, similar to their mo model for Diablo 3 and all the other Diablo games, so... I mean, Diablo 3 only had one expansion, so Reaper of Souls, which, you know, got a little bit stale after the first few months to a year of playing it. So, hopefully if they go with that down that route, they make it so that the expansions are, like, a lot more in-depth, or they can go down the route of, you know, just releasing a bunch of large patches every, you know, two, three months that has a bunch of content in it in addition to in addition to just seasons because seasons are making a comeback I'll discuss that later um, and also the fact that the expansions they, they also did mention that they do plan on um, adding more classes whenever they release an expansion so in, from what it sounds like to me they're planning on multiple expansions and then each expansion will have you know one new class maybe two I don't know if they'll have two but it's safe to, it's a safe bet that they'll have at least one new class per expansion so that could be cool add a lot of uh, playability um, there will be a hardcore mode, obviously, it wouldn't be Diablo game without hardcore mode. Uh, they are currently exploring options on how to implement crossplay between consoles. So this right here is a, probably the biggest factor that tells me that this game is way, way long away. Like, we're talking late 2021 at this point, maybe even 2022. So, I mean, if you don't even have the foundation down to, like have cross like know whether or not you're going to be able to have cross play between like ps3 and xbox or you know xbox and pc or whatever then that means that your game is like not even close to ready to be able to ship out to customers like that is like i don't know it's, it's not a red flag because it's good that i'm happy that they're taking their time with it because it's important that they get this right because a lot of people don't like how d3 turned out so um but i mean they're showing it off already, so people are going to have expectations. Um, trading, crafting materials, and consumables will likely be tradable, uh, with a possibility with a possibly with possibly a system of uh, certain items being able to be traded once, and that's it. And I believe that they referred to this as bind on trade. Uh, so BOT, I guess, would be short for that. So basically, how that would work is so for 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 items that can be traded, I assume that they're talking about like crafting materials. So like. In D3, that would be like reusable parts, uh, arcane dust, or not arcane dust, whatever the blue stuff is. I don't remember what it was called. Uh, and like the, those uh, veiled crystals, or those uh, yellow crystals. So stuff, stuff like that will be uh, just, you know, bind on a... Or not, it won't be bound at all. It'll be free to trade uh, however you, however many times you want it to. So that's good. And then the bind on trade thing, I guess, works where you find an item and you equip it. And then once you no longer need the item, or you find an upgrade for the item, you replace that item, and then you trade somebody else, or you you know you sell it to somebody else, you give it to somebody else, and then once that person you trade it to for the first time equips the item, it's bound. They can no longer they can't go then go and trade the item to somebody else. So that's that's sort of cool. Uh, but they they clarified that the best items, so legendaries plus, however, will likely remain uh, bind on pickup. So that means that once you find that item and you pick it up, it's bound to you forever. And you will not be able to trade the item. So, we'll see how that ends up uh, being fleshed out. They also mentioned that the trading system that they have currently right now is still being, like, in is obviously in development still, so... Like I said earlier, everything is subject to change. Uh, it was mentioned that crafting will play a big role in the game, and the developers want it to be important, so that's pretty cool. I know in D3 they had stuff like, you know, Hellfire Ring, Hellfire Amulet, which was more centered around like uber stuff uber like killing uber bosses and getting mats for that but that wasn't really like a crafting system that was mainly just like you know two specific items that people like to craft so i hope that in diablo 4 we'll see you know actual rare items become valuable like if you craft like a rare item with like super high stats or like very very good rolls for like certain types of stats and they'll be very useful for you so in that sense, I hope crafting makes a comeback and uh, can be very useful. Because they did mention that they want people to actually go out of their way during like the story mode, during questing, whatever you're doing in the open world, to pick up crafting mats and like to actually be actively looking to, you know, being able to craft good, uh, unique pieces of gear. So that's good. The loot system will be will remain similar to D3 in that item drops will be unique to each player and only they will be able to see it unless they re they themselves drop it on the ground. So it's kind of expected. Um, I mean, it's how the game has worked for the past seven, eight years. I don't think they wanted to change that. It sort of plays hand-in-hand -hand with how the trading system will work. Um, 
if if the items are going to be buying on pickup most of the time for all the good items, then it doesn't really make sense to change like how that would work. So I um, don't have any complaints about that right now. Clans will return with shared banks. So that's something new. Didn't have shared banks in D3. Uh, mounts will be in the game to help with traversing the massive world. This is pretty interesting, actually. Movement speed modifications will be a lot more tempered in D4 as opposed to D3. So as you guys know, if you're a whirlwind barb in D3, you, you know, pop sprint, you pop Wrath of the Berserker, you start whirlwinding, and you're, you know, torpedoing off into the distance at 400 trillion miles an hour, like, space rocketing around the map. I don't think they want that in D4, which is why they're introducing mounts, which is definitely interesting because we've never seen mounts in Diablo before. I mean, unless you're a crusader and you have, like, the steed, but could be interesting because they also mentioned that there are specific uh, there are specific um, skills and abilities that you can use to dismount and attack at the same time. So like if you're on a mount and you're like charging into a horde of enemies, you can use an ability that will dismount you and immediately start attacking. Whereas I guess if you don't, then you're going to have like a second or two of delay. I don't know. I don't, I'm not really sure how they, what they meant by that, but it sounds pretty cool. Um, also sounds like they want this to be sort of uh, more focused around exploring. That's why they don't want you to be just like zooming around the entire map in like two seconds. So we'll see how that works out. Um, there's going to be a new mechanic introduced called stagger. Um, and the way stagger works is if you continuously use crowd control effects on a boss, then instead of that boss becoming immune to that crowd control effect, which we've generally seen in D2, D3, etc., that boss will actually have a stagger meter, um, and then once that meter is depleted by using CC effects on the boss, the boss will be stunned and then also may provide additional positive effects to the players. So I don't know. Let's say, I'm just throwing out a random example here. Let's say you're fighting against some sort of like Hydra boss, and you reduce their stagger meter to zero. Uh, it'll cut one of their heads off and expose like a, an area of the body that takes additional damage from attacks or something. I don't know, it, it, it adds for more uh, choice or decision making in terms of combat too, which is nice because if you're in a group and I don't know, you can maybe have one guy designated to doing CC on the boss to reduce their stagger meter while the other people just attack it, I don't know. Could be uh, pretty cool in terms of strategizing how you want to take down a boss, so we'll see how that plays out. There will be world events with notifications given to all players of the location so that everyone can participate. This one is interesting. So I saw in the demo, I forgot who I was watching, but uh, there was a world boss and as soon as it spawned, it sent a notification out to everyone in the area that the boss spawned and it showed you where the boss spawned. So everyone went over and there was like 10, 15 people there all killing the boss and the boss dropped like I think a legendary item for everyone. I think that was part of the demo. I don't think that always happens, but it was really cool because I mean, even if you're not in the party with the other people, you're, you're still participating in the world boss killing. So actually looking forward to how that uh, plays out in the real game. Uh, max party size is 4. Now this one was a little bit weird because in the uh, the uh, Q&A session they did mention that the party size, the max party size right now was undetermined and that they weren't sure how they wanted it to turn out. But then in one of the uh, interviews that I saw for the stream, uh, the guy said that the max party size is 4. So I assume this is extremely subject to change and they're just going with the max party size of four right now and it could change but I, I don't know personally i think this is probably what they're going to end up settling with i don't see why they would be there would be any reason to change that maybe they'll bump it up to five but i doubt it uh there is currently this is interesting too so the next the next two points are big ones there is a keyed dungeon system which is something that they mentioned they were going to talk more about tomorrow so I'll go ahead and take a look at the panel tomorrow see if I miss anything. Uh, this sounds very similar to how the rifts worked in Diablo 3 and likely will be the end game of D4. Uh, from what I was able to gather, there will be hundreds of dungeons throughout the world and you will be able to access the max level versions that have special modifiers through keys that offer better loot. Um, and the way they made this sound, if you guys are familiar with Path of Exile, is it sounds a lot like maps do in Path of Exile. Because the way this works and the way this differs from Rifts in Diablo 3 is that it's not like each monster does not have specific modifiers on them that are different for every pack of monster you encounter. The map itself has modifiers on it so that you know prior to going into the map or prior to going into the dungeon 
um, exactly what the modifiers are going to be for each monster in the dungeon. So you can plan ahead, you can say to yourself, okay, I don't like this modifier, I'm not going to do this dungeon, or I like this modifier, I am going to do this dungeon. So in that sense, it's very similar to Path of Exile, where you can like pick and choose and pre-plan ahead of time what you want to do in terms of like taking down certain modifiers in dungeons, stuff like that. So in that sense, I really am a fan of this mechanic. Uh, there's also, this is the next point. Set items were actually described as being stepping stones towards other legendary items as if they were not on the same level of power. In D3, we saw that set items were obviously the most powerful items in the entire game, and it looks like the developers want to change this due to the players feeling pigeonholed into playing certain builds dictated by those set items. And I definitely agree with that sentiment in that I felt extremely pigeonholed into playing uh, builds based solely around the set items themselves. So, for example, I played Barbarian most of the time, so I was, you know, I was uh, pigeonholed into playing, you know, Raycor's charge set, uh, Immortal Kings, which was like sort of like a mixture set where you just had like, uh, you know, the call, of the whatever the, like the call of where you like call like those like uh, knights to help you fight, and the uh, Might of the Earth set, which was the Earthquake set. Those were the three main Barbarian sets that I remember. Um, and you would have like some legendaries in your gear, you would have like the belts, like usually would not be set items, the boots, you have bracers, like those would generally not be set items, even sometimes weapons wouldn't be, uh, rings, but most of your character was green, which is set items, uh, and that, those dictated basically what you did with your character 90% of the time when you're playing the game at max level. But they want to branch out from that in Diablo 4, and they want legendary items to be more powerful. They want you to have more freedom in choosing what you want, you know, your character to be doing in terms because like, basically what they mentioned was each legendary item is going to have a special legendary affix on it, um, or legendary effect as they call it. So, like for example, we saw in the demo there was like a, a barbarian two-hander that like I think it no, th no it, it was a, a sorcerer two-handed staff, and I think it made your fireball project like two additional projectiles or something. So stuff like that. Um, if you have like a full character like decked out in different uh, legendary items that had effects like that, that could be extremely powerful, more so than set items probably. I mean, depending on how they decide to tackle set items, like they're not going to make it to that like fireball deals four thousand percent more damage. So I don't, I don't yeah, they're not going to do that. Um, but uh, they also did mention something interesting in that uh, there is a new rarity of item above legendary called mythic, uh, which is the most powerful type of item in the entire game. And you can only equip one mythic item at a time, uh, and they will n and they will have four legendary effects on them. Uh, and they mentioned that uh, they won't. So if you have, uh, I don't know, if you find like a mythic pair of boots, that specific pair of mythic boots will not always be programmed to have the four four of the same uh, legendary effect on them. So. Let's just say, I don't know, I'm just making this up using D3 terminology. Let's say you're a Whirlwind Barbarian, and you find Mythic Boots. Uh, and they have three Whirlwind Legendary Effects on them. Um, you're obviously going to want to keep farming those boots to get four Legendary Effects on them for Whirlwind, because that's going to be better for you. So, in that sense, they're going to essentially make you, you know, continue playing the game, continue farming better Mythic pieces of gear. So, to me, it sort of sounds kind of similar to ancient items in D3, but it's more profound than that because of the fact that it's not just stats, it's also like different kinds of effects on it, but we'll have to see how it plays out. Seasons will return, I did mention that earlier. Something interesting about Seasons is that they said they want players to constantly be giving them feedback on certain items or, or talents or effects or whatever that they think could be cool to make a certain build viable to be used in the game. And once they've gathered enough information about what items they think could improve like the uh, different uh, versatility in certain builds or even provide new builds entirely, they can then add new items, new effects, new skills, whatever, to the game through seasons. So, I don't know, let's say it's currently not possible to play World and Bard because it's just not powerful enough. But if only they had this one item that did X or Y, then it would be good enough. Well, the developers could create an item that would, you know, do exactly what the exactly that and add it to the game through a season, and then you could obtain that item through the season. So, 
stuff like that could be cool and add a lot of different options, opportunities uh, for the game through seasons, so that's cool. There will be a gambling system with gold, much like how blood shards operated in D3. Uh, this will ensure that gold will always be useful in some way. This is really good because uh, if you guys played D3 at all, like over the past four years or so, you all know that gold is basically useless, <laughs> besides like rerolling st stats in your gear. Um, I mean, I was walking around with like hundreds of trillions of gold at some point, and it's basically useless to me. So, you know, being able to exchange gold or gamble with gold for you know, some of the best items in the game makes it extremely valuable. So, I like that a lot. Um, you know, it adds worth to gold. Make if you're going to trade stuff. I mean, we already mentioned mind on uh, trade, but I don't know how uh, profitable those items will be. The current penalty for dying is that you need to run back from the previous checkpoint and you also drop a bunch of gold, so you need to go pick that up from your corpse. This is not super harsh, like I know in Path of Exile you actually lose some experience from dying, which is pretty bad, or not bad, but like harsh. Um, whereas in D3, I mean, as, as I just mentioned, it sort of ties into the fact that gold is actually valuable now. Um, so, you know, dropping gold is not something you want to be doing, obviously. So. Uh, a bit more of a penalty than dying in D3, as dying in D3 doesn't really have any effect on you, so that's interesting. Uh, runes are returning, which is nice because they were not present in D3, so runes coming back from D2. Uh, on the side of character customization, they want you to have nearly as much freedom as you do in creating a World of Warcraft character, so that's pretty cool. You know, like scars, tattoos, facial features, eyebrows, whatever whatever they want. I mean, obviously you can have a lot more customization than Diablo 3 did. Uh, and then lastly, the last point that I have here is that PvP was a factor in nearly every single decision that the development team made in creating the game. So, that's really cool because they mentioned that um, one of the big reasons why PvP failed so much in Diablo 3 is that they weren't really thinking about PvP when they made much of the game. I think PvP was more so of an afterthought in D Diablo 3. So, I mean, the scaling never worked, it was, just, it was a mess. Like, the skills weren't based around PvP, it, it just never worked. Um, whereas in Diablo 4, like, from the ground up, when they were building the core mechanics of the game, PvP was, like, in the front of their minds and they were doing the whole, you know, groundwork for the game. So, I think PvP could actually be decent in this game. At least much better than Diablo 3 was. I mean, PvP was in D2, and it actually was not bad in Diablo 2, so... Um, I think it could have a potential effect to change the entire dynamic of the game. I mean, especially going back to my first point, which I made about the open world system. If you're if you're like running around and you're you know farming you know mats or whatever you're doing, you're just walking around the world and you encounter somebody um, who is like also doing the same thing as you, and you see them like looting something and you want that, like you could attack them probably and just like I don't know engage in PvP. So that could be cool. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it'll work yet. Again, I don't even think they know how it'll work because the game is so early in development, but that could add a different layer to the game that we haven't seen, especially in D3. There's, some, there's, there's nothing like that in the game, so... Yeah, that's pretty much going to cover everything. Uh, again, if you guys meant, if you guys uh, like caught something from BlizzCon or any of the streams or any of the Q&A sessions that I missed, let me know down below. Uh, apologize for this being a little bit of a longer one, but there's a lot of information to cover, so... I um, appreciate you guys listening in. I hope you guys all enjoyed this, and I'll see you all in the next one.